Welcome to LeapCast. I'm your host, Dr. George James. LEAP stands for leaders, entertainers, athletes, and performers. And I'm on a journey to connect with high achievers and highlight their unexamined human moments. Tune in to learn how these high achieving LEAP individuals were able to reach their greatest potential, face their most difficult challenges, and embrace the human moments that helped them along the way. If you want to get the episode highlights directly in your email, then head to theleapcasts.com right now to subscribe. Welcome, everybody, back to LeapCast, where we talk to leaders, entertainers, athletes, and performers. I'm so excited to bring another great friend, someone I've known for a few years now. Uh, or, you know, Ben, I always want to call you Evans. I don't know. Welcome, everybody, back to LeapCast, where we talk to leaders, entertainers, athletes, and performers. I'm glad to bring another one of my amazing friends, uh, Benjamin Carlton, who I've known for a few years now. Uh, ben, thanks for, for joining me. How are you? Of course, I am uh, fabulous and I'm excited to be with you, Dr. J, and looking forward to, you know, you always know what to say, when to say, how to say, and how to pull it right out of me. So I don't know what to expect today, <laughs> but looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, we're going to have a good time. And I, look, you know, Ben, I've appreciated you and all that you do. Uh, so the way that I like to start is what we call is a leap story, which is just being able to just talk about your kind of early beginnings, family, growing up, siblings, you know, things that shaped you early on. So what would you say if we were to go back to some of the early days, what would you say is your part of your early story? A part of my early story, of course, hailing from uh, the city of brotherly love and sisterly effect, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I had a very blessed um, childhood. Um, I was given access to uh, many things some adults still don't have um, access to. I was in uh, Mayor John Street's cabinet meetings at age, I believe, 13 or 14 on Mondays. Wow. Um, and so I really valued my uh, childhood experience in Philly, growing up in the hood, uh, starting in, you know, I always tell people, you know, I, I started out in Mount Airy, but then when Section 8 opened up, we moved over in the Northeast, and that was like my first bout of racism, because uh, I came up with all the Black folks in Uptown Mount Airy, but then when we moved to Northeast, you know, I was like, what is this, and who are these people? <laughs> uh, and so uh, my Philly experience was very much diverse, um, challenging, uh, but made me who I am today. Um, came up in a very huge family. Uh, my grandmother had uh, 14 children. My great grandmother had 11 children. So I had 10,000 cousins and we were always together. My house was the hangout spot. Everybody lived with us. Um, I almost never had a room to myself, not because of my siblings. I'm the eldest of four, um, but it was relatives who were always with us. And so I always, um, and I'm like that today. I'm a host. I love to to help and people are always at my house so <laughs> training huh where just people coming over you had to host them now you're still doing it okay yeah so yeah. so what tell me you know as you talk about these early phases of your life being in cabinet meetings and your large family you know and, and i know you and you have a great vibrant personality how how was your personality being developed in those early years with your family well it wasn't until recently through some therapy sessions some years ago that I realized that I um, experienced a lot of trauma at a very early age. Um, in our communities, especially Black, we normalize behaviors, patterns, experiences, and don't recognize them as traumatic experiences that shape who we are. And so I was a very feminine when I was a young boy. Um, I hung out with all girls. My best friend was my girl cousin, Tiana. And uh, I didn't know that being feminine was wrong. I didn't know that being gay was an issue until people told me to stop doing what I was doing. Stop flirting with boys, stop trying to kiss boys, stop hanging with the girls. And so I was just being my normal self. And so I learned uh, to ask and become who people wanted me to at a very early age for love and acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, I learned how to, to, to hide who I truly am in order to fit the norm. Um, but that 
came with so much pain yeah. and so much shame um, that I wanted, didn't want anybody else to experience that pain and shame. So whenever I walked into a room, I tried to be the life of the party. I tried to make people laugh. I tried to make people happy. And that is like, you know, uh, uh, followed me along today. My, my motto is lead with love, close with laughter. There's not a moment you're with me. You're not laughing. You're not full of love because I didn't feel I got that in its um, pure essence. I got it because of who I became to receive it, but I didn't get it for being authentically myself. Mm -hmm. And so I became the lovable, golly, jolly, happy guy because of the trauma in, in, that I experienced at an early age. Well, first of all, I mean, you're already doing this. So shout out to therapy <laughs> for uh, helping you oh. some of that and, and being able to face you know, that what you experienced was trauma, right? And that so many, like you said, so many ways we normalize things. And sometimes people just wouldn't know that behind the curtain, behind the layers is pain, is shame, is embarrassment. Uh, because, right, people might see that, like, the love, the laughter, but not that you were feeling all of that pain. Uh, and I, I, what I'm wondering is, like, how how early were you just feeling like you had to mask that or cover the the hurt and pain that you were dealing with as early as uh kindergarten wow. i um kissed one of my guy friends as kids do when i tell this story adults like i can't oh please do the kids do it all the time no harm is meant um but i kissed one of my guy friends uh in kindergarten because we would play like house and doctor and the girls would peck the guys on the cheek and so forth. So I was like, oh, well, hey, honey, I'm home. Peck them on the cheek. <laughs> and um, everyone said, ooh, you know, you're nasty. You're gross. I'm telling. Mm -hmm. And that shame I felt, mm -hmm. I didn't want to be the weird kid. I didn't want to be the kid that everybody thought was gross and disgusting. Uh -huh. So I stopped, right, and tried my best not to act on, you know, the urges and feelings that I had. Um, and then, you know, people would tell me to toughen up, be a man. I'm like, I can't. I'm a boy. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm be a man at five. But all right, I'll try my best. Um, and then when I, I, I was always uh, felt some type of anxiety in athletic environments. And I thank my mom to try to break me out of this uh, feminine phase, as many people thought it was, uh, put me in a lot of athletic spaces and not, I don't have an athletic bone in my body. I'm built like a football player, but um, can't throw worth anything. Um, and so I would be teased. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why they named a medicine Ben Gay, but it's ruined my life. <laughs> oh, no. You know, I've never put those two together, but oh, my gosh, I can imagine. It ruined my life. Um, you know, I was called all types of names. Fruity, Ben Gay, Sissy, Fag, uh, Flame. Um, and while... I, you know, I dealt with a lot of that on my own yeah. because I could go home and say, mom, they called me the N word or mom, they called me black this, but I felt shame going home saying, mom, they called me a sissy. Mom, they called me a fag. And so I kept a lot of that to myself and dealt with it myself and either masked it, buried it. Um, but it was, it was very early um, that I had to deal with trauma and shame and pain on my own i had no outlet no one to talk to and you know just growing up right there's so many things that we could be teased about ridiculed about and you know trying to hopefully be on on one side where you're not being ridiculed but sometimes that means you are the one in inflicting the pain and when we talk about identity we talk about sexuality it's a struggle across the board but definitely, I think growing up, I would imagine from what you're saying, growing up as a young black boy, it's so hard, right? I mean, right, growing up as a young black boy, maybe now, is totally different than Absolutely. however many years we want to put on your life when you were growing up and and how hard it was. And like what you say, like the start of like shame and embarrassment and that, but not really having a place where you can talk about it and then getting messages about toughening up. And I, I know you like in and just the amazing way that you carry yourself that takes a lot of strength and like where did that strength come from to deal with and handle some of that um 
I believe it was divinely given. Mm. You know, no one taught me uh, to be resilient. Um, no one taught me how to put on a mask. No one taught me um, how to uh, master rooms that I walked into so that, you know, at least you're laughing with me versus laughing at me. So how do I control this room so you're laughing with me instead of at me? All those skills I kind of self-taught myself. Mm -hmm. And so I believe they were divine. Um, you know, I also played church when I was a kid, but didn't come from a religious family. I would bribe my friends uh, with snacks to come in the yard. And I would, you know, I was one of the first ones to do the crate challenge. I would set up crates in my yard and set them up as a pulpit and just stand up on it and like preach and read, you know, Genesis. I don't know where that came from. I didn't come from a religious family. So, I mean, I didn't know that, right? So your family was not religious at not all? Heathens. <laughs> we didn't go to church. I don't even remember what we did on Sundays. I think we just played. Um, you know, I started going to church as a teenager um, uh, at, a, at 12 or 13. And over the years, my parents got tired of dropping me off. So they would send my sisters and then they eventually came and then other family members started coming. But we weren't religious at all. So I know it was a divine just connection to my destiny that I had the strength, I had this resilience, but I also had the urge to connect with something much deeper than myself. And I always tell this joke, I, mean, I know some of us look like monkeys, but I don't think we came from monkeys. So I, I, would, I would just sit and look up at the sky like, Lord, why are we here? Where do we come from? What is this life all about? Why am I gay? Why am I black? Why am I being teased? I had all of these questions at a very young age. Um, uh, but all, all self, no one, no one taught me, nor was anyone interested in answering any of those questions. <laughs> you know, and, and some of this we'll probably get into more, but I, especially as we go further in your journey, but I, like these have been strong identities for you, right? In terms of your faith, in terms of sexuality, in terms of race, right? And, and how that has been important to you and even so much more where you've combined them together to tell your story. But it, but it sounds like some of this was developing at a really early age. You know, I thought maybe that happened later on post college, but it sounds like you were dealing with this stuff from single digits to early double digits. Yeah, I I fashioned myself a revolutionary at a very early age. I was always the one standing up for justice, standing up for what's right. I was the teacher's pet. I was one of those safeties that wore like the orange badge with the uh, uh, monitor field on it. I was a hall monitor. Um, I, you know, and, and I know a lot of the pursuit of doing right was to try to mask uh, being teased for being uh, feminine and, and, and gay. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the journey for a lot of people in the LGBT community. We pursue um, achievements to mask um, you know, well, I might be gay, but I got all A's. Mm -hmm. I might be gay, but Based everybody, on. right. What, what can you say? I'm doing better than you. Right. And so I pursued a lot of those things. Um, uh, but it, 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 it was always in me to just stand up for what was right. Um, to stand on the side of right. Although I was bullied and really didn't do anything to defend myself. I stepped in for people who were bullied. Because it really didn't bother me. And, and Dr. James, crazily enough, in my little head, whether it was arrogant or not, I would always say, yeah, you're teasing me now, but I'm going to do way better than you in life. I promise you that. <laughs> and long and behold. No, no, just kidding. No, 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 um, <laughs> I mean, look, I hear that because like uh, my secret thing that I would say, all right, you just wait. Like, it's going to happen. You don't know, but I don't got to do nothing. But you will see one of these days. Yeah. And. and but I'm really curious about like how you were able to, to stand in the gap for so many other people. Like when do you, when was that, when did that start happening for you? I get very early on. I, I believe it was because I was doing for people what I wanted someone to do for me. Yeah. And God always blessed me as I got a little older with friends who loved me and who would stand up for me? I always had some type of, I mean, for lack of a better explanation and for clear understanding of the, the audience, I always had a hood friend. 
and that hood friend was willing to do hood things right. to take care of me. We all knew. The, no, the, we... hood, the hood protected me. Right. Philly hoods protected me. Like when I wanted to do bad stuff, they'd be like, no, you stay. Mm-hmm. What? I want to be bad too. No, you can't come. I want to have fun too. Like they knew something about me clearly that I may not have known where they were willing to protect me. And so eventually it's the, the energy I put out, I started getting back. Um, and so at a very early age, I would protect those who I thought needed to be protected, um, came up in a very diverse community in Northeast Philly. We had people from all backgrounds and generally of uh, those that came from foreign countries who couldn't speak English well, were teased and made fun of. Even the teacher sometimes would not treat them right. And I would stand up to the teacher, you know, to make sure that they were taken care of or they weren't forgotten. Um, I would often get in trouble because they didn't understand the work. So I would give them the answers. <laughs> so they wouldn't get in trouble uh so that was that was in me ever since ever since uh, early on yeah yeah you know it you know it's interesting right like you're saying it and it's a joke but it's uh, you know it's true right like i think the hood gets a bad rap in so many ways there's so many great amazing people that for quote unquote live in the hood or live in situations or circumstances that might be tough or challenging but there are just amazing people that are there. Even the folks that sometimes might make some questionable decisions are also real good people, right? And I remember folks who would, the same thing for me, like, nah, George, you don't need to be doing that, right? You you, you, you fall back, right? And, and thankfully, right, that helped oh. <laughs> So I'm curious, right? So I know, like, after, you know, Philadelphia phase, uh, I know that you are... You went off to college and that you're really, really proud of the college that you went to. Uh, so so tell, tell me a little bit about that journey, getting, getting, go to college and, and how did that, did that same mission kind of follow you in, in college? So I always tell folks I got on I-95 and went the, went the wrong way. Um, my dream was to always get to New York City, uh, be a host on Good Morning America and live my best life. I applied to every New York school known to mankind, NYU, Fordham, Hofstra, Cornell, um, got into some, waitlisted for others, um, uh, eventually chose Hofstra, uh, but, you know, we couldn't afford Hofstra University. I didn't know anything about in-state, out-of-state fees. I just knew I was trying to get out of state and away into New York. Um, I did not apply to the number one HBCU in the nation, the Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, until after I graduated high school. Um, My principal knew a recruiter, Dr. Johnson in Philadelphia, a famous Black dentist who uh, was instrumental in in pipelining so many Black uh, students to FAMU, got me in. Um, And uh, still didn't know anything about in-state, out-of-state fees. I just know I need to get away and become my own self. I knew nothing about the HBCU experience. Crazily enough, um, our business school at uh, Florida a and uh, School of Business and Industry has a, a, a very strong and powerful internship program um, where starting, I believe your sophomore year, you have to do an internship, a paid internship in the field of your study. My high school in Philadelphia, World Communications Charter, uh, made us do the same thing, mimicked FAMU's SBI program. So I interned with the Philadelphia Tribune. I was a writer, a youth writer. I interned with the mayor's office uh, in Philadelphia, the city rep's office. Um, Had no idea that that was even connected. So I talk about this divine order of my life where God orchestrated things outside of my control. So I get to FAMU and I, of course, joined the, the college ministries. Um, And it didn't hit me that that was who I was until I went back home to Philly. And one of my youth leaders was like, you know, Ben, a lot of people leave for college and they party, they change or they become who they really are. You went to college and joined church. (laughs) (laughs) The other way. Brother, it's in you. It's in. There's no denying that this power of service and this power uh, to, to a life of, of, of uh, servitude in, in, in the works of, of the divine, it's in you because you could have, you went thousands of miles away from home and could have became anybody and you, your tail went and joined church. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, it was there 
at uh, FAMU that I learned to appreciate my black skin. Okay. Uh, because though I experienced racism, I experienced homophobia from my black community before I experienced racism from a white community. So I always was at odds with some community. I wasn't man enough for um, uh, my black community and I wasn't white, not even white enough, but wasn't white for the white communities that I was in. So FAMU taught me to appreciate the diversity of my black experience, the different pathways um, to success as a black man and to just love the skin that I'm in. I wouldn't trade my family experience for the world. HBCUs for the win. Well, shout out to FAMU. I know a lot of Rattlers out there will probably be excited to hear that. Uh, but, you know, it's it's really, you know, great to hear how, you know, your journey to college and finding a home at college allowed you to be your full authentic self even more and to appreciate your sexuality, your blackness, and and your your faith, right? And, and then to embrace it. You know, for me, I remember, you know, going off to college and being involved in the choir or being involved in these places where we talked about God that allowed me to really like learn more about myself, but also have a different, you know, college experience. And so to hear, you know, like how that was instrumental for you uh, or just added to that sound, you know, it was really great. You mentioned about, you know, having to experience, you know, homophobia in, from the Black community uh, to racism from those outside of the Black community. When did that, well, I'm curious about when did you start to identify as gay? When did you know that for yourself? And and when did that, did you start to even maybe push back against some of the injustices that you were experiencing? Um, I knew, uh, I don't think there was a time I didn't know. You know, I came out, the doctor slapped me. I said, do it again. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't think there was a time I did not know. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, kindergarten where I was shamed in front of the class. And then I acted out in other ways. And I was spanked, you know, disciplined by my parents for acting out in those ways. Um, and so when I finally heard you know, the message from church that being gay was wrong and that you would spend an eternity in hell. While I could not deny who I was, I was shamed and afraid to be who I was for fear of spending an eternity in hell. So I never really pushed back. Um, and unfortunately, I adopted the narrative of the uh, bullies and aggressors. You know, the bully, bullied becomes the bully. And so I would then, as a man of God and someone who represented the church, would then preach that homosexuality was wrong and that you would spend an eternity in hell. Um, and so that that was much harder to stand up to uh, than racism. You know, when the when the when the white kids would act up in my neighborhood, I just you know go get with the black kids and you know we go handle our business. The the hood people took care of me. That's it. That's right. <laughs> And so that was easier to stand up to. I became an advocate for that, right? No racism, all of that. Although I was able to um, uh, flourish in any environment, my mom was very smart to have me in a lot of programs that were outside of the hood, but I would oftentimes be the only black. So I had to figure out how to not get in fights every day and how to thrive in those uh, spaces. And so it wasn't until uh, I, maybe somewhere age 27, 28, where I finally got tired of the mask. Yeah. I finally got tired of the show I was putting on. Um, and that a bunch of things contributed to that, but mainly all of my straight friends were now starting to get engaged and married and I was alone. Mm -hmm. And I got tired of being alone and I did not, I've broken a few hearts over the years and I did not want to break any more hearts because I wasn't sure of who I was and wanted to be with. Yeah, you know, you, you, you're highlighting how, you know, figuring out who we are is maybe one thing. And it sounds like you knew who you were from the, from the early days. But being able to, like, live the life of who we are can be so challenging. And there's so many different barriers or so many different obstacles, right? So you go from, you know, the Black community to 
racism to the church community and all of those communities are pushing against some part of your identity or one of the identities that you hold and and yet you still found ways to still show up and say you ain't gonna get rid of me <laughs> i'm gonna show up i'm gonna be here but yet still having to carry carry that and have to wear a mask and you know there is some like you mentioned like these life transitions that really push us to say i could keep wearing this mask or and be hurt and be devastated or i could push through and and be my authentic self and it sounds like at 27 you did that and so what was your journey like from that point on where you're like this is who i am in all well, i i give you a little bit of a background to how i got to that place um i you know had done so much ministry work over the years ever since i was a teenager i've prayed for people i've traveled done missions clean toilets singing choirs held babies kiss senior citizens all the things i'm supposed to do yeah. and i said god now, I know you hear prayers because I pray for people and things happen. I pray for myself, things happen. But I've been praying pretty much my whole life that you would take this thing away from me and you have it. Mm -hmm. So I met with my pastor at the time and said, I'm not doing any more ministry until God answers me about me because I'm tired of this. I'm ready to make a move. I'm ready to be in love. I'm ready to build a life, but I don't know which way to go. Because while I would love and rather be with a man, I never saw what life like that was yeah. I always was in some type of DL or down low situation where unfortunately I had a boyfriend and a girlfriend at the same time mm -hmm. that was my idea of a healthy relationship which was so not healthy right mm -hmm. um, but I figured it was the only way that I could live and operate and be but I got tired of that because it was toxic it was hurting people and myself and you know fast forward to the Be Me community uh, where we uh, made our connection, you know, a network of community builders that are led and inspired by Black people. I was traveling the country telling Black people to be their authentic selves <laughs> the whole time I wasn't being my authentic self. Right. And oftentimes I would every now and again tap into the, the LGBTQ argument space and I would advocate against same-sex marriage. I would advocate against, you know, uh, civil liberty and all of that. And one time a friend said, now, if not a friend, a boy toy, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, if, if, right, if your followers were to be privy to our text messages, what would, what would they think of you then? And that was the first challenge of like, Ben, you're a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. Two, a sister of a boy toy who caught me and her brother in act, uh, uh, reached out and was like, what if people found out what you and my brother were doing? What would what, what, what people think about you then? So that checked me. Two, or three rather, being in the space of affirmed Black people who know who they are, why they're here on this earth, um, that changes and shifts a mindset if you're willing to be changed. And there was no way I could be around all these powerful, successful Black people in Be Me community and not be challenged to start living my authentic life yeah. and be my best self. And so being um, you know, under the tutelage of uh, uh, our CEO, uh, Travian Shorters, and hearing a lot of the things he spoke about when it came to love and power and self, I was challenged to face all of the narratives that told me that I was less than and all the narratives that told me that I wasn't uh, right and I wasn't worthy to be myself. But also a lot of our grantees or not grantees, fellows, Be Me Geniuses, Be Me Fellows around the country were black gay men in very successful positions. Pastors, politicians, advocates, you know, Malcolm Kenyatta, um, uh, Curtis Lipscomb, Akil uh, Patterson, uh, so many other people uh, who were in these uh, affirmed, powerful positions. I never saw that before. Yeah. I only thing I knew about homosexuality was that it was freaks and perverts and pedophiles. That's the only thing the church preached. That's the only thing I saw. And when I was exposed to what my life could be if I only started living in my truth, I was like, bet. That's it. And that was the start of me living my authentic life 
and being who the divine created me to be. You know, there's something about being your authentic self that is not always possible, in my belief, on your own, right? Yeah, that's yeah. It's out there that sometimes pushes us to not be that authentic self. And, you know, I've had my own be me experience that further helped me to be my authentic self, to, to love and appreciate what I bring to the space. And, you know, I, I, I've had, uh, you know, Travian Shorter's CEO of Be Me uh, community uh, on a, on one of these episodes and just sharing like how I appreciate what that has done for me. And so to hear how, and I know that you are one of the co-founders of Be Me, to, to know that you are out there really trying to empower so many people to be their authentic self that it, it, it had to pull on your heart and pull on on you to say, I can't keep doing this for other people and not live my own truth. Uh, and then people was calling you out on it too. And so, you know, I'm glad that you were able to do that because, you know, we, we hear this and we talk about this so much in so many areas, but representation doesn't matter, right? Like, you know, what we see, what we hear, who, who do we look to? And it sounds like it was hard for you to see people who look like you, who identify like you, who believed like you, that lived a life that felt like I want to live that type of life. And, and it sounds like one, you either started to see that or decided I'm just going to be that myself or maybe yeah. both. Yeah, I know, I know this is becoming a Trabian love fest, uh, but, you know, he he is the the nucleus to so many people's elevation um, uh, in life and, and absolutely uh, part of my evolution. Uh, one thing I learned from him was uh, people can't become what they don't see. People can't become what they don't see. So people always ask, why do you live out loud so much? Why do you have to advocate? Why do you have to always talk about Black queerness and Black faith and all that? I said, because I never saw anybody like me coming up. And had I saw the possibility of what my life could look like if I just lived in my truth, I would have started this early on. And so I do a lot what I do and I advocate and I'm so loud and I'm always speaking out because I want to be that shining light and example for those who are still living in the shadows, for those who are still living in the closet, for those who are still living in shame and let them know, hey, it's possible. And yes, it may hurt. And yes, it's uncomfortable coming out of that darkness, but there is life on the other side of it. I had no idea that there was life on the other side of living in my truth. I thought people would hate me forever. I thought I'd be cast aside. I thought I wouldn't be able to make a living and get a job. My life increased tremendously. And that's not everybody's story, but it was mine. I was thrusted on the national stage, started doing work with the White House, started speaking in places all over the country and inspiring people to truly now be their authentic self. And everybody that I've worked with in the past, when I would see them again, they would recognize something shifted in you. I said, yeah, a dark cloud has been removed from my life. Yeah. I'm not battles anymore no I, I, that's awesome and you know i love the way you show up and i love how people show you that they love you your authentic self and you know that that once again some of the things that we don't often see or believe right we're, we're talking about your story in particular but i think this translates to so many people's stories that in being your authentic self there are people who will love you and see you and care for you the way that you are and and so all of this came together and I know that you wrote a book and, and I guess, tell me one, tell us about the book and, and, and your journey to be able to say, now that I'm living my authentic self, I'm going to, I'm going to ring the alarm, right? I'm going to let more people know. And how did that all come together for you? Yeah, I, I always knew that, and people always told me that I would like write books and tell stories and stuff like that. So I, I the book I originally started writing, Dr. James, <laughs> was all about being delivered from homosexuality. Uh, I had a brief moment in church where I pretended to be delivered because that's what, you know, was acceptable. That's what would get me speaking engagements and all that. So, um, you know, I was going to write a book about how to be delivered from homosexuality. Mm -hmm. and of course, thank goodness that book never came to fruition. But I got tired of people asking me, how can you be gay and a minister? How can you be gay and a Christian? It makes no sense. And I didn't have the answer. Honestly, I said, I know what I feel. I know what the spirit has said to me, but I can't answer you. So it took me about three and a half years to put the book together to give answer to that question. 
But every time I found an answer to the question, it just opened a pathway for another direction to take and another direction to take. And I mean, literally, I was like, okay, this is too much. Mm. Because before I could get the black church or church, but specifically the black church to talk about homosexuality, I had to talk about the black church taking down white Jesus in the church. Uh, And talking about how colonialism disrupted who we are as an African people and how in indigenous communities around the world, in Native America, in South America, in Australia, before colonialism touched, before Europeans uh, had influence, we celebrated love and God in so many different ways. And we did not put so many polars on life where it had to be just boy and girl and God on Sunday alone. But in Native America, they celebrated two-spirited people. One in 1,000 people on this earth are born both male and female. That was celebrated in our indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, it kept taking me down further paths to understand how we got here. How did homosexuality become the biggest sin? And when did it become a huge sin? The word homosexual didn't get entered into the Bible until 1946. Mm -hmm. Many people don't know that story. And there was a theologian at Harvard that wrote the Revised Standard Committee, which was a committee of white men who said, hey, if you change words like pervert and pedophile into homosexual, you will then weaponize the faith against the people. They didn't respond. They did it anyway. They responded and said, you're right, we'll change it. They didn't make the change until 1977. By then, the damage had been done. Many people don't know these stories. So every time I learned something else, it took me down another path to learn more. And so uh, the basis of it all was, is, is be love mm-hmm. um, to yourself, be love to others, and we will be all right. Jesus said, if you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself, you can hang every other law on those two things. And that became the basis of my truth and the basis of my ministry. I'm not going to tell you how to live. You don't tell me how to live. How you live is none of my business. God didn't tell me. To, God told me to be love to you. And that's what I'm going to be. I, I, I love that in your journey to answer questions that you've been asked or you've been asking yourself or you've been asking God, you learn more. And as you learn more, you're like, somebody needs to know this. Somebody needs to hear this. And, and, then, that, and, and then that led you down another path. And then somebody needs to know this, too. And, which I think talks about who you are and how you want to inform and educate and, and free so many people. And on some level, though, it's meant that you had to go through your own journey and your own pain to do that. And that's not easy, right? There's a lot of burdens that a lot of, a lot of people have to carry to open up the path for other people. And it sounds like that's been part of your journey. Um, and so you, you came out with the book and what was it like for you to now write this book and to put it out there and to help so many others? It was absolutely freeing. Um, it was therapeutic. Um, I had to revisit some things. Again, I had built a very strong practice and pattern of burying a lot. And so I had to uncover, unearth some word scars, uncover some bad traumatizing experiences, live through them, work through them. And it gave me a lot of conversation to talk to my therapist about. <laughs> um, I would Honestly, though, uh, Dr. James, that I went to therapy prior to coming out Mm. Um, because coming out, I I knew it wasn't going to be the best experience. I didn't expect it to be what it was. I received thousands of hate messages uh, from people even dressed in ministerial attire telling me I'm going to burn forever. I'm going to go to hell. I don't deserve to, you know, be alive. I'm a disgrace. I mean, the words were, but I also had thousands of messages of love and support and thousands of messages from people who were struggling with the same thing, being themselves. Um, And so it was a very, very overwhelming experience. And so being able to write out a lot of that, of my life, being able to write out about a lot of those experiences were very uh, therapeutic. And uh, every time I feel like, okay, is this the right path? Um, you know, am I, am I, am I doing the right thing? I'm tired. Um, someone will say your words changed my life. 
Mm-hmm. Your words kept me from committing suicide. Your story gave me so much hope for the future because we're not equipped or armed with the history and the knowledge because this is something not too many people are going to investigate. And when you really want to have a, a one-on-one with a lot of the people who rail against homosexuality, they're not, they have no valid points. When a lot of my work is based off fact and history um, and not opinion. And so when someone can read factual information that gives reason to why you know a homosexuality is a sin in the bible but not a real sin and all those things it just brings love and light and understanding i'm a teacher i love to teach and so being able to do that over and over again and see light bulbs go off in people's heads see people uh lift out of that darkness as i did is an amazing experience and i know that i'm serving my divine purpose uh, every time that happens. But like you said, it came at a cost. Mm -hmm. It wasn't easy getting here. And while I do have a lot of zeal and a lot of courage, it takes a lot to every day wake up and decide to rail against, go against the grain. Yeah. Yeah. To to go, you know, to be in my LGBTQ community is one thing, but to leave that community, to go on the faith-based community, to go on the policies and politics and fight against don't say gay in Florida and, and all of these books being banned in, in other states, to, to, to wake up and decide to do that when I could be making money some other way, um, it's a hard choice to make, but it's the right choice to make. And you know, to that point, right, it, it's often hard to Say that I'm gonna wake up today and go for the, go towards the fight. No, yeah. I could be hurt. I could be bruised, or I just like gotta muster up a whole bunch of energy, and when I could just be chilling. And, and so, <laughs> right, and, and you know, it does take something like this internal fortitude, this uh, willingness to say, not only is it the right thing to do, not only is the thing that I I'm called to do, but it is what. I need to do. And it sounds like you've been able to do that. A few questions I like to ask people as we kind of, you know, get close to wrapping up. One, what, f- there's four of them, but first, what what are you doing now? What What's, what are the things that you're working on now? I know that you're always busy, you're flying all over the country, you're speaking, you're lots of different things. So what would you say you're doing now? Right now, um, I'm trying, well, one, traveling, yes, I love to travel. The, my motto of late has been the world is crumbling, life is short, do it while you can. Right. <laughs> Don't put anything off, do it while you can. Uh, but I am working on taking stories from my book and putting them on paper, well, not putting them on paper, but writing scripts um, for shorts, uh, features, and films. Um, I just completed my audio book, so I'll be doing some marketing for that. Uh, one of our uh, Be Me brothers, uh, Ace Epps out of Akron, Ohio, produced it. Um, and it's really fabulous. There's music, there's a whole bunch in it. Um, and then uh, trying to find ways to make the world a more equitable place, whether that is training organizations on um, uh, 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 with Be Me and asset framing, are helping organizations be more equitable in their practices and their programming and marketing messages. And then uh, honestly, trying to live the soft life. Yeah. Just, you know, trying to live as stress-free as possible. I'm about to go to Ghana next week um, uh, for a yoga retreat with some folks out of LA and my sister. I uh, plan on spending December uh, in Bali and Thailand and you know, come back whenever I want. Because life, uh, I've been through a lot not to be able to enjoy the benefits of this hard work. And so that's what I'm up to. And whatever comes my way in that, I'm excited for it. Uh, but that's what I'm up to. Just telling stories, turning on the lights, and uh, making spaces equitable. And, you know, I love that, you know, on the other side of all the struggle, the trauma, the hurt and pain that you've had to in, endure from uh, from a young age to, you know, probably just this morning, uh, that you, what I've really loved is that you have really gained this thought of, I'm going to enjoy my life. That even though so many people or so many things try to tell me I shouldn't or that I shouldn't be who I am, that's not going to stop me. And it, I know 
you've probably gone through more than one passport in the past few years, right? <laughs> the amount of stamps that you have on your passport. And what I also love is how, like, I I can look at almost any award show or anything that is like a big event, and somehow you're going to be on the red carpet, right? There you are, like, you know, showing off your latest outfit on that red carpet, which I, I just love that you do. And so I like to ask people, who would you love to collab with? Who would you like to work with? And like, it seems like you already have a lot of these connections already because of the way that you show up. But I'm still curious if you could work with anyone, if you could collab with anyone, who would that be? Right now, I am trying to and first time saying it publicly. And so when it comes to the past, I will then replay your show and say, That's right. Guys, look right, here. Did, right here on the show. I want to collab with Lil Nas X. OK, he has a voice um that uh can be very very beneficial as we try to move the needle forward to equity yeah. um and not only that but move the needle forward in just understanding and appreciating people's experiences and i know he is he is unorthodox in a lot of uh you know what we may call antics but he's an entertainer hello that's what entertainers do but two, he has the ear of so many young people and young people, Gen Z and beyond that are gonna be the catalyst to make this world a much, much better place. And so we, if we could have someone of his influence leading the charge in so many different ways, getting people politically involved, getting communities to have more things that center around the diversity of our human experience, that would be amazing. So I uh, would love to collab with Lil Nas X. All right, all right, we hear that. And you're right, like the the way that he might go about it is gonna cause people to talk, period. And yeah. as a result, that's gonna create dialogue and discourse and that there's lots of people who connect with him. And I can only imagine uh, uh, Ben Carlton and Lil Nas X collab, like that's that's gonna, create discourse and impact people in a profound way table. <laughs> so i want to throw this one in just because i know you and we've had these conversations uh what is it that you with all that you've shared and all you've experienced what is it that you desire when you think about love mm. when i think about love I think about, um, I think about perfection and not perfection and everything's right, but perfection in the way that the Bible speaks about perfection and something being complete. Mm -hmm. I'm being created and made and experiencing the things I'm experiencing so that when we connect, our stories are complete. It's kind of like the the ring that people use when they get married. It's a it's a it's it's ever going. It never stops, but it is a completion of the story. And the story is not going to be all great, but it's a complete story. And that is what I think about when I think about love um, and what I'd like to feel and what I'd like to experience with someone. I am complete. You are complete. When we come together, the story of us is complete. And that's what I want and think about uh, with love uh, and, 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 and the, the authenticity of that dynamic is so important. Like, let it be real, right? Let it be true. Um, one of my prayers uh, in the last couple of weeks was Lord unburden me from the things that are untrue. Even my desires that are not real, let them, let me let, so that I can hold on to the thing that is real. And so I want love to be real. You know, I think that is something that everybody should have, right? Something that is real, it's complete, that is true, right? Not not this fake stuff, not this here today, gone tomorrow, uh, but something that is authentic, that's real, that's maybe even tried, right? That's been through some stuff and, and that is complete. And so I, I think that's a great um, aspiration and a great thing for you to have. And so- I'm gonna, I'm gonna add that last part too, try, yeah. because this it, until it's been tested, yeah. oh my. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. You know, being married with the kitties, you know, until it's tried and true, you know, it ain't true till it's tried. Right, exactly, yeah. we, uh, right. We've had those conversations about, yeah, you know, not not everything that comes up that feels real good right away, it, 
it's going to last. It, need, it needs to go through some stuff. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate you sharing that. So last two questions. How would you define mental wellness? Wow. I would define mental wellness as uh, being in a state that is true for you beyond what people say you should be, beyond what you think you should be, and just being in a true state of you. A lot of times, um, our mental unwellness is attached to things that, again, that aren't real, that aren't for us, that are, aren't, that are not true, whether it be goals, people, circumstances. But when we let all that go and willing to show up who we are, right, and willing to do the things that contribute to the totality of our life, um, I believe that the condition of your mind, the condition of your heart, and the condition of your body equals your quality of life. And when any one of those things are not in alignment, it impacts your quality of life, it impacts your wellness. And so it is a space where you are uh, true to who you are in your mind, in your heart, and in your body, and taking care of all of those things. And, and you know, if you don't do maintenance on your car, you, the car might not have a problem, but if you don't take it for an oil change, you will have a problem. Yeah, right. <laughs> going through anything right now but if you don't exercise this body you have problems if you don't take care of this mind you have problems if you don't take care of your heart emotionally and even physically you have problems so being in a space where you're truly yourself and you're taking care of those components that make up your quality of life i love it shout out to that mental wellness maintenance get that oil mental wellness oil check uh, I, I love that so last question what mental wellness advice would you give to your younger self? And that could be as early as yesterday or any time in the past. Wow. My mental wellness advice is your peace, your contentment, your satisfaction, even the love that you crave will never come from anybody else. All of that needs to come from you. Yeah. So stop looking outwardly and start looking within. That's what I would tell my younger self. Uh, that, that's that's so deep and profound. Uh, you know, the thought that we have to first feel it and be it for ourselves before we're going to get it from anywhere else. And with all that you shared, with all the different identities that you were trying and have been trying to navigate to finally come to your authentic self i could see how that would be so paramount not just for you but for all of us right like this thought of love yourself and then let the other things come from that ben it's always a pleasure talking with you i always enjoy our our talks and conversations i'm glad that you're able to join me here on leapcast and before we end any last words that you want to share or put out there well, one, thank you for this opportunity. I'm so happy to see this come to fruition. And I'm so happy every time I turn on NBC or anywhere else, I see a good brother that I know. Um, but my last words would be, until you bring your full self to the table, the universe cannot recognize you and give you everything that belongs to you. There are truths and elements to your lives that is the key to your next are key to whatever the universe has for you. And so as long as the universe does not recognize you because you're not living your truth, those things will never happen. I love it. Awesome. Um, and, and I appreciate, once again, you being authentic, you putting your, your authentic story out, but also your willingness to love yourself and to get up every day, live life to the fullest, enjoy your life, but also be willing to face the fight that might be out there. Ben, thanks so much for, for joining me. Thanks for so much for sharing. And I wish you well. And I look I look forward to hearing of, one, your travel stories, and two, uh, all the collabs and the way that you're going to continue to make an impact for people. So thanks. Thank you. Wow. What an incredible ride we just went on with another great member of the Leapcast community. I appreciate you listening and hope you got some tangible value from the episode. Please let us know what you think by leaving a comment, rating, and review. As always, please don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. This is Dr. George James, and I'll see you next time.